Well, good morning. Welcome to the service at Tabernacle, Sunday School Hour. Take that big book there, please. The Living Hymnal, 415 is the page number. 415, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. We'll stand, please. We'll do stanza one and three. And it's good to see you as always at the house of the Lord on Sunday morning. 415, you have that page number? And everyone find the book, find the page, and everyone sing on stanza one, sing it together. What a fellowship, what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine leaning on the everlasting arms. From all along, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Stand to three together. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near leaning on the everlasting arms leaning leaning safe and secure from all along leaning 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 on the everlasting arms and thank you you may be seated here's our pastor all right. Good morning. How many are enjoying that cool weather out there? Isn't that good? Cool weather. I love fall. I do. I love fall. So glad you're here this morning. If you have your Bible, just for the devotional, we have looked all month, or at least tried to look all month, at missions and our responsibility to go, to give, or to love. But if you look at Philippians 4, I want to point out something that um, hopefully will be an encouragement that... Uh, the end of missions. What is at the end of missions giving? Now, I don't know. I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the area, but I'm sure that we have orchards somewhere in Greenville. Is that right? Anybody nod at me? Is that right? Now, I'm going to assume that most of them here, what I recall are peach orchards. I don't remember. I don't remember apple orchards, but is it peach orchards that we have here? Apple orchards? What do we have? We have, we have peach. Is that right? Well, and, and um, do we have no, no apple trees here in Greenville? We had just okay. All right. Well, the fall, the fall in Alabama, we had a couple of orchards, um, and we didn't have peach. But there were a few peaches, but mostly there would be apples and other things like that. And uh, we would during the school year. I can remember vividly taking my son to the Christian school he started at, and uh, we would stop at that orchard on the way home. And they had this. Uh, they had fresh pressed apple cider. But they put it in a machine that turned it into this apple slush thing. And I don't know how to describe it except it was really good, addictingly good. So, man, in the fall, that we'd stop there, you know, and they'd start putting out signs for apples. And then they would let you come in sometimes and, they, you know, you could, you could go and you could try all their apples. You know, you could try Braeburn apples and Arkansas black. Anybody here know what an Arkansas black apple is? Brother Porter, you know what that, an Arkansas black keeps for about two years because it's got preservatives or something inside of it. I have no idea what it is, but it keeps a long time. But they had all kind of apples, and, you know, you could go and they would slice them. Oh, sure, you can try one. Well, you could eat 12 apples in one, you know, one visit if you wanted to. And I enjoyed that. And the smell of an apple, even right now, I'm thinking about if I had an apple right now, that'd be really good. I like fresh crisp sweet apples some folks like those granny smiths i'm not much on those but i i like i like sweet crisp apples and there is nothing like that but you know we have things today that are that are so so well done that uh i was visiting a church and preaching and um i'd thrown my stuff down i'm getting you know getting a acclimated to the new quarters that I'm in and 
and they had on the table that they're all kind of food there, all kind of snacks and stuff. And then they had they had this big bowl of apples right in the middle. And I thought, praise the Lord, man. And I reached over and I grabbed one of those apples. And when I put it up, I, I honestly I got about that close. I looked down and I thought, something doesn't look right about that apple. And I started looking at it a little closer. I smelled up, didn't have a smell. And I thought, my, that's a, it, it was a fake apple. But it looked real. Now, honestly, I don't know how I would have explained to the pastor why he had a bite out of a fake apple at his parsonage. But I almost bit into it because I, I enjoy fruit. I mean, that's the culmination of all the planting, the growing, the, all the weeding, all, the, all that stuff. That's, that's the end result. It's the sweet reward. And this world is full of so many things that are just like a fake piece of fruit you work your life for or you work so hard to achieve or to buy or to gain. And, and in the end, really, when you, when you look at it, after you take a bite out of it and you know, the fragrance is just not really there anymore and it's just not really satisfying, but look at Philippians 4, missions, the end of your missions giving, the end of our missions going, the end of loving other people. Paul writing, he says this in verse 17. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Now, not just one piece, but a lot of fruit. Um, we had some apple trees. I've told the story, and I, I, cut, I cut off. We planted so many fruit trees in our yard when we first moved to Ardmore, and I slowly just cut them all down. And one year, one year, had one left and somebody had taken a Christmas ornament little hook and they'd screwed it into one great big apple and hung it on our tree out there. Boy, it was just, they got the big laugh at church. Hey, preacher, saw an apple on your tree. Hallelujah. Well, you know, with my apple, on, my apple tree, if it, if it only produced one apple, it still wouldn't be very enjoyable. Here it says fruit that may abound. Sounds like a lot of fruit. And then he says in verse 18, but I have all in abound, I have... And am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which are sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Now, I know those two verses are back-to-back, -back, but there's an odor, there's a fragrance, there's something there. And then there's fruit, there's something there that is tangible, but also something eternal. And here's just what I'd like to remind us of when we talk about giving to missions and going. That there is an eternal reward of fruit that can abound to your account that there is no artificial substitute for. And when we get to heaven, we're going to be so thankful that we had a part in that process. And I've said it before, I really believe, honestly, I do believe, I believe we're going to meet people because of folks like Jimmy Rose and Melvin Vaughn, David Edens and others. We're going to meet people in heaven because they were sent out of the church that you attend and you know what? I think there's going to be a fragrance of a sweet smell. And I think they're going to turn around and start introducing you to other people. I've heard many times people talk about, well, D.L. Moody must have a lot of crowns in heaven because he won two million souls. You know what I think D.L. Moody's going to do after he uh, gets his reward? I think he's going to turn around and he's going to bring that shoe salesman up. He's going to say, now let me introduce you to the person that's responsible for all that you just saw. And going to point back to him and he's going to say, this is the man that pursued me and that loved me. And I think that guy is going to sit back seeing D.L. get rewarded, I think he's just going to say, wow, oh, this is real. This is good. So don't just look at missions as a duty to have to give, to go, to love. There's a fruit at the end, and it's of the most unique kind. It's a divine fruit. I don't know what kind of fruit. How many of y'all like? You like fruit? How many out there, you like fruit? What kind of fruit is divine fruit going to taste and smell like in heaven? What's that going to be like? I'd say it'd be better than any apple pie grandma could ever make. Because it's sweet, it's eternal. All right, all right. If you stand to your feet, we'll let our teachers slip out right now. So good to have our guest this morning. And uh, glad that you're here. And glad that we've got some our regular people here. Going to let our folks slip out. There they go. Appreciate these teachers spending time getting ready for lessons. Somebody said to me this morning that my tie wasn't orange. 
I'm looking, Brad, looks like you're wearing a red tie. <laughs> I love you, Brad. Amen. Amen. I appreciate that. All right, let's have a word of prayer, and then you can slip to your classes. Lord, thank you for the day. Help us to remember that in every, every piece of labor, that there's always profit in it. And the labor for souls in this world, whether it's by giving or loving or by going, that one day that there'll be a reward, there'll be a profit, a fruit for that. And it'll be something that we'll never lose. It'll be something that'll never fade. It'll be something that'll always be fragrant throughout eternity. What a joy to have a part in that. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Dismiss to your class. Our young adults are going to hang around in here. Thank you again for being here. This is an order to home Bible class, and our ushers are coming at this time to receive the Sunday school offering. This is the first Sunday in October. Man, can you believe we're in October? Woo! Yeah, Christmas times are coming. <laughs> It'll be your before we know it, amen? But thank you for being here, and our tabernacle folks, you look around, we have some guests again with us today, and we'll have time of fellowship after a while, but thank you for being here. We always look forward to the Sunday school hour here at Tabernacle. I think the pastor's going to teach this morning. So you come ahead and we'll give him all the time that he needs to teach the lesson. God bless you, sir. And the Sunday school lesson is yours. Amen. Will the bell ring in here? No. You be my clock for me. If my microphone was on, I just asked Brother Hover to be my clock this morning. So, all right, Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to be teaching the whole month um, of October going through the book of Philippians. We've been going through there. I appreciate Brother Eshelman and uh, him working to make certain that uh, we've been going through a book of the Bible as well as Brother Terrell Rose, and I know they've been doing a great job. I've heard many comments, and uh, I'm going to take this month, Philippians chapter 3, and just do some teaching of the Bible. I think it's proper. Now, we've got our we have our class here this morning. I don't have them all right now because I'm looking normally. There comes another one in the back. Tad, come on down. We're just going to sit as a big block right down here. And um, several of our, our young adults, we call them, I guess, a young adult fellowship. And uh, I'm glad that they're here this morning. Um, normally, we start off with blessings in our class, ask people to give a testimony of a blessing. And uh, I'm just curious, is there anybody in the auditorium that you had a unique blessing this week? that you'd like to make known? Is there anybody at all? All right, Brother Spanagle. And the preaching of Brother Willis and all the blessings that he brought down to the preaching of the gospel. In particular, he preached one night on, on a faith that works. And it was just a tremendous sermon. I thank the Lord for him for that blessing. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Brother, we, uh, we suspended classes Friday night from the college and went over to the Pickens County camp meeting. And uh, Abraham Tillman's here. He's from Alabama. He'd never been to a camp meeting, and I was excited. First camp meeting we got there, and, and a church from Zirconia, Zirconia Baptist Church. I, Zirconia sounds like someplace in the Bible. I don't have any idea how far away Zirconia is. But they started singing, and uh, then the service just kind of got 
we got people testifying, and, and, and by the time it was time for Brother Willis to preach, even close to preaching, he just got up and he said these, I'll never, I hope I never forget these words. He said, well, he said, Brother so-and-so told me never to sow seed when the wind is blowing. And man, there was just all kind of stuff going on, and nobody preached. And Abraham, on the way home from the thing, he said, well, he said, nobody preached tonight. <laughs> I said, I'd never been to a camp meeting. Nobody ever preached that before. Every camp meeting I've been to, they always preached. But uh, it was unique. And I was so glad that our college got to be there for that and uh, see and really hear so many good testimonies. They were so encouraging. Next to me, a lady stood up and talked about her dad passing on, another lady across the way, and then children that had been wayward that had come back to God. And just, it was amazing. It was amazing. Brother Hale, you have your hand up back there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It was it was it was really good, and really, um, another thing, Brother Willis said. He said that he said that there is always. A, or I think he may have quoted Jack Shook. He said uh, he, he may have said Pastor Shook used to say, or maybe I don't know who he said, but he said that there's always somebody that holds a key to the service. And that God gives them that key, and that if you use that key, that he'll open up the service to everyone. And that evening, there was a lady, and I don't know her name. She was from Zirconia Baptist Church, and she, she started, they sang a song, great song. I don't know, Brother Hobart, I don't know, if you, are you still here, Brother Hobart, he leave? If he did, Robbie, I want you to find this song, It's All Right. That's, and I, that's the only thing that I know. How to, that's only for, but they were singing this song about that, that it's all right. And she stopped after that first verse and started testifying about how that she had been raised in camp meeting, talked about Buck Huntley and started naming other people. And uh, I really believe if there was such a key, I think that her testifying in between those verses sort of just opened up that song. And then after that, I don't know how many times in a row they sang that song. Brother Hale, what, three or four times? I mean, they kept singing it over and over and over again. And, uh, and it wasn't one of those things either where somebody said, okay, sing it again. I'm talking about every time they were singing, it just seemed like God was just doing more. People going to the altar. So it wasn't being, you know, something that was being contrived. God was just using that song. And then there was another song uh, that I've never heard either. Um, and I think one of Jack Shook's granddaughters was singing in that, and it was just a remarkable thing. And uh, I, I like to be where God is. And boy, God was there. And uh, I just wished I could have had my whole family there to see all that. Um, nobody, nobody ran the aisle. Nobody swung from the chandeliers. Well, they don't have chandeliers out there. Nobody swung from the rafters. But I'm telling you right now, God was right there in that place Friday night. And uh, Brother Willis is just such a dear preacher friend of mine. I love him, and I appreciate that. Well, if I don't start teaching, so it's, it's, it's two minutes after 10. So we stop at, does anybody know? 1045. Okay, since Brother Hobart's not here, who's going to be my watchkeeper for me? I need to know at 20 minutes till, I want somebody to wave their hand at me. Who will do that for me? Okay, Robbie, I pick you. All right, thank you, Robbie. Do you have a, do you have a watch, Robbie? All right, not having heard all of what's been taught in Philippians chapters 1, chapter 2, I'm not going to go back and try to give you any background information. Let's just jump right into chapter 3, and uh, let's just look at some of these first, first few verses, at least the first six verses. And uh, this morning, we'll just try to learn a little bit of the Scripture. The Bible says, verse 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision, for we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof that he might trust in the flesh, I more. 
And then he gives a long list, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. And it needs to be read, we won't look at it today, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Lord, help me this morning to be able to teach your people the way you would have them taught and open our understanding to your scripture, Lord. We're trying to follow the command to study, to show thyself approved unto God. And Lord, we want your approval. We want to live a life consistent with what you, you love and the things that you abhor, the things that you would stand in opposition to. Lord, we want to take the same position. And Lord, I pray you'd help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, verse number one Let's save that for just a moment, but go to verse number two. Look, it's very, very unusual. Beware, beware, beware. Three times. How many of you saw a sign on the fence that said beware, and then you saw a sign on the door that said beware, and the back of the tag of the person's car said beware? How many of you think you would probably have your senses raised to be expectant of something not good? You, you, would you think so? So beware. And the beware here, he's writing to the Philippian church, and I've heard it said that there's nothing negative in the book of Philippians. This is negative. Three times, beware, and he says three things to beware of. And if you were to really try to define that, I think he's saying beware or a danger of Christianity is, if you'd write out beside verse 2, worldliness. Worldliness. That there is a danger of worldliness that will spoil your relationship with God. And the reason I say that is, first thing he says is beware of dogs. All right, beware. How, many, how many people don't like dogs? Anybody here doesn't like dogs? I'm just curious. Abraham doesn't like dogs. Anybody else doesn't like dogs? Mrs. Miller doesn't like dogs. Mr. Rappinchuk, Brother Rappinchuk. Anybody else doesn't like dogs? Brother, San, uh, Brother Catapago, all right. How many people don't like cats? Would you raise your hand? All right. You'd almost think God would say beware of cats, but he says beware of dogs, and here's why. Beware of dogs. And here's, if you'll put a little mark right there and go, if you would, to 2 Peter 2. Now, I don't know how you teach in the auditorium always, but this is the way I teach comparing Scripture. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2. When he says, beware of dogs, he's not talking about the furry kind. Right? That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about being aware of the canine family. He's talking about this, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 21. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it. All right, so somebody knew the way of righteousness. Somebody's been taught the way of righteousness. How to live right. How to live by faith. How to live according to the principles of the Bible. All right. To turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. So now they've turned from it. And here's why. Look at verse 22. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, that the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. And you know, a dog, a dog here in verse 22, turns to his own vomit, just like somebody that knew the way of righteousness and turned back to the world. Now I wish that I wished it was true that there was. No testimony of people ever doing that. But how many of you know somebody that uh, used to be in church, used to have a Bible, have a testimony, but they are no longer, they're not in another church. They didn't, they didn't go to another church. They just went into the world, have nothing to do with God. Would you raise your hand? I'm just curious. That's all over the building. Now, here's what he's saying. Beware of dogs. He's not saying beware of turning to worldliness. He's saying beware of the people that would carry you back to the lifestyle you used to live. And, you know, we've got a young adult, we've got a group of young adults here. I see some scattered back there. I'd love for them all to come sit here if they would. But the, uh, the truth is evil communications corrupt good manners. And what that means is this. He's saying to these Philippian believers, look, you've come out of the world. You know the one true God now. Beware of the people that would take you back to the lifestyle you had before you got saved. Now, I think there's an easy solution to that. You know one of the easiest solutions to make sure you don't end up uh, spending too much time with somebody that would carry you back to the wrong lifestyle? Just talk a whole lot about Jesus. <laughs> you talk enough about Jesus and people that aren't saved, they're going to get uncomfortable. 
They're, they're going to, they're going to, you won't, listen, you won't have to look at them and say, listen, I'm trying to live a holy and righteous life. I'm trying to be pure in God's eyes. I'm trying to stay pure and clean, and I'm just not going to be able to fellowship. With you. you don't have to say any of that. All you have to do is just say this. Let me tell you what I learned about Jesus today. Spent a little time with him this morning. He's been a good Savior. Oh, listen, let, let me give, just tell me tell you one story about how he healed this man that was blind. You know what they're going to do? They're going to start backing up is what they're going to start doing. Or they might step your way, but they're not going to say, why don't you come with us? Because they're not really interested in that kind of conversation. So you need to be aware of people that will carry you back to an old lifestyle. For that reason, we have an older congregation that does not use Facebook. But we have a younger congregation that does use Facebook. You need to be careful about being carried back to a former lifestyle by people you used to go to school with 20 years ago. Amen, Brother Joel. That's good preaching right there. You need to be aware of that. All right, I didn't say that you can't talk to those people. I just said you need to be aware of dogs that would carry you back to where you were before you got saved. All right, look at it again, Philippians chapter 2. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Well, that's pretty straightforward, all right? So beware of somebody that would take you back to the former lifestyle. Then beware of somebody that works evil, all right? Go back now to 1 Peter chapter 4. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. What's an evil worker? Well, that's pretty common. Common, a common phrase, they're evil workers, they're working evil. But look at it, 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 3. All right, The Bible says, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness. All right, that's a loose lifestyle. Lusts. All right, that's, that's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life. Excess of wine. Revelings, that's a big party. Banquetings, it's a big feasting. And abominable idolatries, all right? That could be worship of an idol, could be covetousness. Verse 4, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. So here in verse number 4 is a people that believe in lasciviousness. They believe in lust. They believe in excess of wine. They, they are partakers of revelings. They're partakers of banquetings. They're partakers of idolatries. And it says, they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. These are evil workers. These are people that, that work evil in their life, all right? And you need to be aware of those people. Now, I think we ought to be a witness. I think we ought to touch the world. I think Jesus was a friend of sinners. But I think you need to be aware of evil workers, for instance, if you have a set of friends that like to drink on the weekend and they invite you over, maybe what you ought to do is invite them to a church service and see them other than the weekend when they might be drinking and having such and such a good time. You need to be wary of those kind of people. All right, we have some younger people again here. They're younger people. If there is a group of people, they have a, a loose lifestyle, like to listen to the wrong kind of music, wear the wrong kind of clothes. You need to beware of evil workers. They have, they have a different set of moral standards. Now, I'm going to say this to all of us. If, if you're born again, if you're born again, the Bible's clear. You should not have physical relations with anybody outside of the marriage covenant. It doesn't matter what the world, the world may say, an affair is okay as long as your wife or your husband doesn't find out about it. That may be the world's philosophy, but that is a sin in the Bible. That's called fornication and adultery, all right? All right, well, here's what you need to be careful of. You need to be careful of being around people then that think immorality is okay, that think drinking is okay, that think that, okay, I can do all these things and they work them. And the reason you need to be careful of that is because if you get around those people in their environment, then it can bend you that direction. And it'll take you away from fellowship with God. Come on, you folks that are older, couldn't you agree with me? If you're in fellowship with the world, it, you can't be in fellowship with God. You may love the Lord. You may have the right Bible. You may even have a good heart. But the Bible says that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be a friend to sinners. I can be a friend to sinners. I can talk with them. I can try to be fr genuine friend. I'm not talking about pseudo-friendship. But the Bible's very clear, if I'm a 
friend of the world, that system, evil working. I can't be the friend of God. They're, they're at opposite ends of the spectrum. I lose my fellowship with God. So he's warning them. Okay, back again, verse number two. All right. And then he says this. <laughs> and this is a strange wording in the Bible. Beware of dogs. People take you back that, that former lifestyle. Beware of evil workers, all right, folks that work evil on a regular basis. All right. And then he says, beware of the concision. All right. All right, concision. If you look at the next verse, he says, for we are the circumcision. Now, all that means is this. That's a, in, 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 in a medical terminology, that is a cutting away, all right? So he says, beware of the concision. Beware of people that have no cutting away, that have no separation. If you look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, maybe this will help shed a little light on it. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, the whole passage is talking about the world, all right? It, it's talking about men that are lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. But look at verse 5. Here's what, here's what a concision looks like. Somebody that's no cutting away. There, there is no separation. There's, no, there's nothing. Been, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Somebody that doesn't have anything that's been cut away. Now that leads me to say this, and I'm just, this, this is where we are in the Bible, okay? Um, there are people today that believe that as long as you love Jesus, that anything else is acceptable because the main thing is loving Jesus and, and loving other people. And if you'll do those two things, then you can basically live however you want to live. And there are a lot of churches that have sprung up. That message has resonated with them. You can go to their church and you can socially drink. You can do that. Nobody's going to say anything to you negatively about that. All right? They have no separation. And in fact, what they do is they would say churches like our church is a church that's full of legalism because of our separation because we think there ought to be a distinction between men and women because we think that the Bible does teach there are things that are clean and unclean. So what they say is they had this ideology, no, we don't believe in any kind of separation whatsoever, we just believe in love. Now, I wasn't part of the hippie generation, uh, you know, I, I, uh, in fact, right now I'm driving a Volkswagen, okay? It's my daughter's Volkswagen, I'm driving a Volkswagen, but when I think of the hippie generation, what first thing comes to my mind is a Volkswagen van. All right? If you had one, I'm not calling you a hippie. I'm just saying it's what comes to my mind. In my mind, a Volkswagen van with flowers on it, somebody steps out of it that's barefooted, has some kind of, you know, base-colored dress that has little flowers stuck in their hair, and they're singing, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. That's what I see when I think of the hippie generation. And what they're all about is they were all about, let's just love one another. Come on, people now. Let's just love one another right now. Let's just end all the war. Let's end all this. Let's just love each other. Well, you know what came out of that movement? A whole lot of um, immoral diseases. A culture that believed that it was good to get high and just enjoy the body. A group of people that went to Woodstock and lived out that ideology. And the pictures of Woodstock. And I know you guys, how many of you guys have no idea what Woodstock is? Be honest, would you raise your hand? Woodstock. I, I, I'm going to guess hundreds of thousands of people gathered up in New York. And some of them didn't wear any clothes. And some of them, they'd get, they, they, they would free drugs everywhere. Um... Immorality open, but the filth that was there, it was so filthy. The pictures I've seen where they had places for people to, to go and, and use the restrooms, it was so filthy. And then the things that happened out of all that, you know, this, this idea was just about love, so we're just not going to have any kind of standard of cutting away. That, that did not turn out well for that generation. And 
you know, that generation struggled with things and I think continued to struggle with things, the baby boomer generation. They continued to struggle with things afterwards because of what they had done back in their past. And the Bible's very clear. You can have a form of godliness but have no power. And that's because you're not connected to God. And listen, now, I, whether people want to agree with this or not, Jesus Christ, all right? I'm not preaching, I'm just teaching. Jesus Christ was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. So if you want to fellowship with the Jesus of the Bible, he was holy and separate from sin. Now, people may not agree with that, but that's who he was. In fact, we had, we, I've heard of, of people that uh, take issue with saying anything's right or wrong, and, and in doing so, what they do is they allow, they give an allowance to live however you want to live. Jesus said, if you love me, can you finish this for me? Keep my what? Keep my commandments. All right, and he says, my commandments aren't grievous. I'm not putting something on you that is hard to bear. I'm doing it for your benefit. Um, how many of you remember your mom and dad putting a rule on you and uh, you felt like that rule was oppressive, but as you got older, you understood what they were doing. They were trying to do something for your own benefit. Was anybody besides me? Yeah, yeah. Son, don't stick a fork in the outlet. Why would you take away my liberty? Why would you do that? Well, Stick it in the outlet and find out. <laughs> you know, just because you have liberty to do it, and I, I got to get off that because I want to go to Galatians. Galatians is so many times quoted and misquoted and mistaught about the liberty we have in Christ. You know, the Bible says this, that the liberty we have is not to be an occasion to the flesh. I do have liberty, but not for an occasion to the flesh. Now, go back to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Um, so we're warned about, we're warned about dogs, people that would take you back to a former lifestyle. You're warned about evil workers, people that have a lifestyle of working evil. And then you're warned about people that have no degree of separation whatsoever. You're warned about those people. You're not warned about what they're doing, you're warned about them. And the reason you're warned about them is because if you make connection with them strong enough, they're going to carry you where they are. But look at the next verse, all right? So you have the danger of worldliness, but then in verse 3, in verse 1, and this is where we'll just end today, you got the joy of being centered on Jesus Christ. How many of you just, just, just would agree that there is no joy like knowing the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm not saying that to be cliche-ish. The joy of the Lord is our strength, the Bible says. Cancer, cancer is not a joy. Losing your job is not a joy. It's not a joy. Having a spouse leave you a note and saying, I'm no longer in love with you is not a joy. All right, but your life, your life is not determined. The joy you have is not determined by your circumstances. You can still have joy with cancer, with a spouse that departed, with financial uh, situations in terrible condition, you can still have joy, but you can only get it through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say it this way. We were down in Mexico. And Daniel, were you with me down in Mexico? We were picking up those people uh, on the... On the they, down in Mexico, they picked up people with a 15-passenger van. We'd even given them one. And they would put like 45 people on a 15-passenger van. I mean, they're stacked on top of each other. I mean, they're sitting on the floor. They're sitting on the dash. I mean, we had... It was completely full of people. And we pulled up to one place of residence, and they said, oh, this is Brother Luis's mother's house. Brother Luis was a drunk. He was the town drunk, in fact. And uh, his mother would go out, and she would cover him up with a blanket from time to time when he would be drinking, and, you know, he'd passed out on the sidewalk. And his mother was a saved woman, and she went to uh, Bobby Gates, missionary we supported down in Mexico. He and his wife spent their lifetime down there. And she was just telling him, please, uh, would you witness to my son? So Brother Bobby got to witnessing to him, and sure enough, Brother Luis, he, he, he exchanged his bottle for the blessing of being born again. And he got saved. And listen, then he got called to preach. And even right now, he's the pastor of that church. And, you know, but his mother, the first time I met her in the service, they said, after hearing that story, they said, and that's Brother Luis's mother, little bitty lady. Oh, she had a smile that lit up the room. And when they said, we're going to pick up Luis's mother next, I thought, great. And when we pulled over to where she lived, 
honestly, this isn't an exaggeration, it was like somebody had built a house out of cardboard. In a little place that they called a ranch, which was more or less a very poor, poor subdivision in Mexico. It would be worse than any project you would go to in America. Hey, you know, my heart kind of sank. And then when she came out of the entryway into her little cardboard house, she had the smile that lit up the world. And I'm looking at her. She's walking out, probably dirt, listen, dirt outside on the floor, on the outside floor, inside, probably the same thing. And, and she comes out and she's got this beaming smile. And it was, it was just like God said, <laughs> all that stuff you have will never make you happy. Look how happy that lady is right there. There's a joy in being centered on Christ. And look at it. Now, this is great. And this is right in the passage. Verse number one, finally, my brethren, rejoice. Can somebody finish those next three words for me? Rejoice in the stock market. Rejoice in the election. Rejoice in the outcome of last night's game. Come on, what does it say? Rejoice where? It's a, rejoice in your hell. No. No, it, that's not what it's teaching. Rejoice in the Lord. In fact, that word finally, it, it, I, I need to give you this because you need to look it up. There, there are six times, or excuse me, five times that Paul says finally. Let me give them to you. He says finally, in conclusion. All right, the ultimate statement I've got to make. In 2 Corinthians 13, 11, he says finally, brethren, and he gives a great command. In, in Ephesians 6, 10, finally, my brethren, and he gives a great encouragement. Here in Philippians 3, 1, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. He says it again in Philippians 4, 8, finally, brethren. He tells you what to think on. And then in 2 Thessalonians 3, 1, he says, finally, brethren, pray for us. Five times, if you just went through your Bible, the five times that Paul said finally. It would be a great Sunday school lesson. But here he's saying, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Now, it's important. Look at the verse above it. Chapter 2 and verse 20. Because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death. That's Epaphroditus. So Epaphroditus was nigh unto death. How many of y'all think that means he was close to dying? Would you, would you agree? So he's close to dying. Why? Because he's been working for the Lord. Not regarding his life to supply your lack of service to him. So Epaphroditus is sick as he can be. But then Paul turns around in the very next verse and says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. You've got to find your joy in the Lord. Look at it again. And it, it, this is something that's repeated. Um, the Bible says in, in uh, verse 7, For what things were count to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is through the, uh, the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering. Paul begins talking about how much, impo how important it is for his relationship for Jesus Christ to be the main thing, not his health, not his achievements, not what he has in the bank, but his relationship with the Lord. And that's because no matter what happens in life, your relationship with the Lord can give you a joy that nothing else can give you. Amen. 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 Look at there, chapter 4, verse 4. I don't want to jump over in somebody else's verse, but I'm going to. 4-4, four, four. look what it says. Rejoice always, and again I say rejoice. Well, that'd be a good camp meeting verse almost, you know, just we want to get people rejoicing, and that's a good thing, having people be able to worship. But it doesn't say just rejoice. Come on, chapter 4, verse 4, what does it say? Rejoice where? In the Lord always, and again I say what? My granddaddy used to say it this way. Granddaddy would say, God said rejoice twice for those people that are hard-headed. You need to rejoice in the Lord. Not in the condition of your car. Not in your life insurance policy or your health insurance policy. 
Rejoice in the Lord. He says, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Look at it. Look at it, verse number 10. I don't think you're getting this. I'm looking at our young adults. I don't think you're getting it. Look at verse 10. But I rejoiced greatly that now at the last you're care of me. What did I leave out? But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Now, he could have been rejoicing over the care that was given to him. But that's not what he's saying. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. His joy is coming from God taking care of him and doing something for him. And, you know, you say, well, how could I rejoice in the Lord? How many of you think that our God's an, a, a living God that's always working? Could you say amen to that? Then rejoice in his works. I just, listen, Brother Spanigle mentioned at the camp meeting, Brother Hale mentioned at the camp meeting, we're amazed and sitting there and just rejoicing over what God was doing. You can rejoice over that. You can rejoice over your fellowship with the Lord. How many of you are still amazed that Jesus Christ would have anything to do with you? Are you still amazed at that? That he would talk to you, that he'd fellowship with you? Rejoice in that. Rejoice in his glory. Every now and then the glory of the Lord just shows up in a big way. And instead of sitting there and just watching it, you know what I say you ought to do? I think you ought to rejoice in it. Amen. Rejoice in it. Rejoice in his music. I believe the Lord has a particular kind of music. The Bible talks about singing the songs of Zion. And uh, I think y'all rejoice in his music. I'll say this. I probably shouldn't say it, but I'm teaching. I'm, I'm getting close to preaching now. I need to be careful. I'm, I'm pulling that rain back. There are a lot of people that get really excited over the world's music. I get excited over God's music. Really? Why not rejoice over his music? It's better. It's got a more endearing, enduring song to it than anything you'll find in the world. You can rejoice over his grace. You ever do that? You ever get just happy about God's grace to you? I mean, how many times was God gracious to you this week and gave you something you didn't deserve? Really, how many times did God do something for you that you didn't work for and you didn't earn? He was just good. I love the fall. Stepping out this morning into that cool like that, you know what? No administration on the earth made that happen. God made that happen. That's his thermostat. You can rejoice in this. We're, we're about to get into the leaves changing, aren't we? I'm sure if they could, they would love to claim somehow that evolution knows how to change the color of the leaves. But I've never heard anybody state anything that makes any sense about that. But you know what God does? God, God can take of the same species, a maple tree, and this one will be red, and this one will be yellow, and this one will be orange. And you know what I say? I say, hallelujah, what a great God they can do that. I look at the changing colors, and, and I see the fall, and it's just an encouragement. You know, in some ways, um, when I was a young boy, I wanted fall to come because it meant the end of grass cutting season. And I, I don't know if that's the right reason, but to enjoy creation. I mean, think about what we did. The world stopped. The world stopped to watch the totality of the eclipse of the sun. People came to Greenville and sat there for probably, what, two minutes and 38 seconds? Is that about right? Two minutes and 38 seconds to watch, and then as the sun was blotted out, all of a sudden the temperature dropped 10, 15 degrees, and the crickets are chirping and all that good stuff like that. And, you know, and everybody's amazed. God does that every single evening. He sends the sun down. He brings it back up again in the morning. He's the one that made the sun. Good thing he didn't make the moon square. We would not have been able to see totality, would we? Just fortuitous that they're the same size that they would be able to block out one another. <laughs> Rejoice in his creation. You can sit and you can see what God is doing, and instead of being caught up in everything else, find some joy in his creation. The other day, my wife came to me and she said, Joel, she said, I just saw a baby deer walking across our yard in the back. She said, it was so pretty. I said, well, leave it alone. And I'm thinking, I'm going to get my gun and I'm going to wait on something else to come through my backyard. I rejoice when I eat God's creation. But she said it was so pretty. We've got hummingbirds coming to our house. And I got so sick and tired of hearing my family talk about it. Because they'd say, oh, the hummingbirds are out there. And I'd go out there and look, no hummingbird. 
We got one hanging in the back. We got two hummingbird feeders in the front. All this beautiful color, this thing that the Army and the Air Force have tried to mimic in its ability, in its, aer its aeronautical ability is unmatched. And this bird zipping around and they're saying, oh, there it was. And I'd look over there, no bird. And then finally, I saw one. I said, where? They said, right there. You see it? I said, where? They said, right there. You see it? I said, there ain't no bird there. But we sit there, we're amazed looking at that. I'm, why not be able to find some joy in the Lord, in his creation, in his work, in his ministry? You understand, if you find joy there, you know what's true about that? There'll be an unending amount of joy you can have because his work is always going forward. Now, that doesn't mean that your, yours is always in a great state, but it does mean that you can find joy in him. Now, the joy in Christ-centeredness, go back to chapter 3. All right, chapter 3. And it says this. Number, so first of all, they're, they're, they're joying in the, rejoicing in the Lord, rejoicing there. Look at verse number 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit. <coughs> you know, if you worship a song... You're just not going to get the same joy out of that when you worship the God of the song. And what I mean by that is this. Worship is something that Christians get to do that the world really doesn't know understand. They don't understand. Now, I think they worship in stadiums now. That's what I, I believe that. I believe they worship in stadiums, and, and I, I love football. I watch it. I, I still, but they, they, boy, they're, they're worshiping in the stadiums, and they've got their orchestras, and they're, they have their alumni associations, and they call each other the same family, brothers. Oh, you're, you're of the Bama Nation, the Clemson Nation. This is my brother, and whoo, hallelujah, there he goes. Hey, man, whoo, there he goes. Hey, man. That's where their tithe goes. That's where their faith promise goes. They give to associations. They buy tickets that are expensive to get in. I believe that's where people worship. But, you know, it only lasts a little while. I'll make a confession. Last night, Alabama came on so late. It was ridiculous. It was a 9-10 game. Come on, if you're going to play football, play before 10 o'clock. You say, well, you're just old. No, I'm just, it's ridiculous. 9-10. I wanted to watch the game, and I'm trying to watch the game. But you know what I kept finding myself doing? Waking up to see the game. And we were winning in a big way. I should have been happy. But I was tired. And then I, listen, I, I lifted up my eyes one time and I, I looked and it was the fourth quarter. And we were winning big. And I just decided I just don't care anymore. And I went to bed. It's short-lived. Now, if we'd have been getting beat by the same amount, I'd probably go to bed anyway. Isn't that strange? You know, you're talking about men being strange. Men think if they walk out of a room while two other teams are playing in a location that they're not there, that somehow that's going to make things better. Not going to change one thing. Get down on the floor. Oh, God, please let him miss this kick. God's not listening. He doesn't care. All right, now. That's a short-lived thing. You can worship at the stadium of the world. You can worship things that have no value. But when you worship the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, you get something out of that. Now, we don't have time to look into it. You know when people worship an idol? You know the Bible says that there's a devil behind that idol? It says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that when a person, work, when people bow down to Buddha, that behind Buddha, that there is a devil that is receiving that. All right, worship is so valuable that Satan told the Lord, if you'll bow down and worship me, one moment of worship, I'll give you everything that you see. You can have it all right now. He valued worship so much that he said, all right, Jesus, you can have everything here. You don't even have to go to, you don't even have to, go to the cross. One moment of worship. Well, I think that the Lord responds to worship. The Bible says that he inhabits the praise of his people. I believe that he likes to hear us praise his name. Amen. And listen, if God shows up and you're worshiping, don't you think that it's probably going to get a little bit better? There's something there. There's a, there's a blessing in having a Christ-centered joy. The last thing, verse number three says this, and have no confidence in the flesh. You know, you can't have confidence in the flesh and have joy, but you can have confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you'll worship him and you'll rejoice in him, you know what I'm sure you'll find out? You'll find out that the Christ-centered 
uh, Christianity is going to bring a joy to it that religion can't. Now, come on. There's got to be somebody here this morning. How many of y'all were excited about coming to church this morning? Really? Now, be honest. Don't raise your hand to impress somebody. I'm not even going to look. I'm closing my eyes. Preacher's head bowed, every eye closed. All right. How many of you really, how many of you really were excited about coming this morning? Were you? Anybody there? Why? Why? We don't have a special. We're not giving anything away. Was it because you get to see your friends? Because you get to show off a dress? Show off a new car? Because your parents made you? Why? Why why am I excited about going? Because my girlfriend's there? Because I get to sing in the choir? Or have you just kind of, if you've ever been, if you've ever been bitten by the goodness of God inside of a local assembly, you know what it makes you want to do? It makes you want to go back and find that same thing again. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Good. You know, I thought last Sunday we had, a, we had a service that was over the top. Anybody agree with me on that? You know what that, you know what that makes you want to do? It makes you want to see that happen again. Then I hear testimony at the deacon's meeting. Brother, Brother Robinson gives testimony at the deacon's meeting about that service. And I'm, we're still living on that service. And it happened four days prior. Makes me want to come back here and say, God, can you do that? In fact, Sunday morning, listen, Sunday morning was so good. I thought there is no way we'll have a service as good as Sunday morning. So we'll just go back and we'll plug it in, God, and I hope you're there. And then God says, no, nah, I'm not going to give you one as good. I'm going to give you one better. You're going to get that from worshiping him. All right. Robert, are you waving at me? Is it time? All right. Is it time? It's time, Brother Holt. Okay. All right. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the warning that you give us that world and this will destroy our fellowship with you. And God, how true that is. And then, Lord, thank you for the encouragement that the joy we can have by staying centered on you, by worshiping you, by rejoicing in you and not getting caught up in all that is around us. Thank you, Lord, for that privilege. Thank you for giving us those words of encouragement. I pray you'd help us to to, to put that to practice. And I pray you'd bless in the remainder of the services today, God. We we do want to worship you in spirit and truth, Lord. And God, we want you to be the honored guest, and we want you to be present in such a way that if we have guests, that they know they've been in the presence of something different. And I pray you'd encourage your people. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you. Dismiss. <clears throat>
good morning. Uh, it's once again time for me to make an announcement about something that's going on at Tabernacle. The first week in November is our share and it's time to start planning for that. So those of you in the church that bake, ladies, gentlemen, there's a sign-up sheet down on the front table here. Um, we've asking, in the past, we've asked these folks to, to sign up to bring a cake or pie, some type of dessert. And once we get that list toward the end of October, I will put together, give you a ticket telling you what day to bring your dessert and what time. So we always start this the 1st of October so that we can get that in place for share Secondly, we need individuals that can help us answer the phone during share -thon. share -thon runs Monday through Saturday from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Those that answer the phone, we like for you to give a four, three or four hour shifts. Our shifts are 8 to 12, 12 to 4, 4 to 7, and 7 to 10. If you would like to sign up to help us with answering the phone, if you will call the church and talk with Ms. Spanagel in the finance office, she's handling that for us this year. She can tell you the dates and the times we have vacant. We'll keep reminding uh, the folks of this throughout the month so we can get this and get it up and running. If you have any questions, you can see me uh, about that. Talk with Ms. Spanagel. We're trying to get it running. Thank you.
Well, good morning again. Welcome to the service at Tabernacle. Good to see you in the house of the Lord on this Sunday morning, the first Sunday and the first day in the month of October it is. And we appreciate the good weather outside. Thank you for being here. And let's stand, please. We'll sing 157 in the living hymnal, 157 in the living hymnal, the way of the cross leads home. Very familiar song. Let's all stand, please. Everybody get a hymn book close by. 157 is the page number. Where the cross. You have that page number? Choir and congregation will sing all three stanzas. Stanza one, lift it together. I'm a those vocal cords, hit those high notes. Stanza number two, lift it together. I am a sea so up a little bit, stand to three, lift it together. Then I need to the way several stanzas down at the cross where my Savior died. Glory to his name. Page 63. Let's lift it on stanza one. Down at the cross where my Savior died. the instruments, O oh, precious fountain that saved from sin. Sing it together. Oh.
come to this fountain. The instruments, join us, please. Come, come to this fountain, so rich and sweet. Cast out our soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge into bay and be rain of peace. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. And to my heart was a blood of mine. Glory to His name. What can wash away? Congregation, you may be seated. Thank you for the good singing. Choir, remain standing, please. We're going to sing in just a moment, page 288 in the old church hymnal. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. Let me say just a word. I have some of these uh, brochures around. October is Pastor Appreciation Month. And I'll read this if you would like to give Pastor Logan a card. You may personally hand it to him or place it in the basket. We'll have a basket over to my left. We have one also in the vestibule for the whole month of October, Pastor Appreciation Month. And we'll collect these after each service. And we'll have a food and fellowship time on October the 22nd after the evening service in the cafeteria. And we'll have a time of fellowship and recognizing the pastor in appreciation. We're glad the Lord sent him our way. Amen? Amen. Amen. Appreciate Pastor Logan and his family. And we love and appreciate them in the Lord. We'll sing now at this time. No choir practice this afternoon. So keep that in mind. If you sing in the choir, be here tonight about 10 minutes till the hour. We'll get started maybe a minute or so early. And we'll come on live at 6 p.m. tonight. Choir singing 288, Never Alone.
I, how many of you found it to be true that after you trusted Christ, you'd never been alone before? At that point in time, he just, he's a friend. The Bible says stick it closer than a brother. I know there are people that would debate that. They would say that religion is just a panacea. It is something that was given to the masses. It's even been described as an opiate of the masses to try to just help their heart and their nerves. But I'm going to tell you, I have been to more than one funeral, and I've seen more than one man leave this world that had cancer. And in that moment of difficulty, there was the grace of God that showed up for his family, that ministered to them and helped them to stand. And instead of having to take drugs or to do something to try to cope, they had a God whose grace sustained them all the way through that. And I've seen that on more than one occasion. No way to explain that except there be a God in heaven. And I do believe there's a God in heaven. I'm glad he doesn't leave us alone. Amen. Glad he doesn't leave us alone. So glad to have you this morning. And uh, I'm going to ask our ushers before they come, if you don't have a card as far as faith promise this morning, we want to receive our faith promise uh, commitment this morning and tonight. And if you don't have that card with you, would you just put your hand up? We want to get it into your hand. If you're a member of this church, Brother Rapp and Chuck, he's waving down here, Brother Styles down here. So men, if you could get some of these cards out. If you don't have one of those cards, if you'll just put your hand up. I see Brother Leland Porter's hand over there on the side. If you don't have one of those, just put your hand up in the air and we'll make sure we get you one of those. And guys, and y'all can just work your way down this way. I want to make sure you get an opportunity to give to Faith Promise this morning. And then as they're doing that, um, how many are glad that we have guests here this morning? Isn't it a blessing that we have? You know, we have guests at Tabernacle just about every single Sunday. And um, I'm glad of that. And if you're a guest here this morning, we, we usually try to give out this little book called Done. It's a very small book inside. There is a, a card that you can tell us a little bit about yourself. And then there's a card that tells you a little bit about us. Is there anybody here for the first time that's never received one of these? If you raise your hand, I'll make sure we get one of these to you. We got anybody that here's the first time that's never, that doesn't have one of these? Make sure we've got all that covered there. Brother Hale, do I see your hand back there? You've already got one of these books, don't you? Amen. All right. But we're glad that you are our guest with us today. Several things to make mention of, and uh, I can't wait to have our children's home. I think they're going to be here tonight. I believe they're going to be here tonight. I think Mrs. Sandy told me that, but we've got some prayer cards for the children's home. I don't know. How many of you, how many of you don't have one of these? You raise your hand. How many don't have one of these? You need to get one of these. They'll be, uh, I'm thinking about just uh, putting one of these out maybe every six months, but uh, um, boy, it's a great prayer card, and that reminds me that uh, Brother James has asked me to read this, um, that we have an event. The, uh, the event is Dinner with the Tabernacle Children's Home on Monday, the Oct October the 30th at 6 p.m. at Silver Bay on White Horse Road here in Greenville. Um, please plan to attend. It's a great time to get to know the kids, to be able to talk and mingle with them. If you want to make a donation, you can give that to Brother Benny James. Brother Benny um, why don't you just kind of walk this way if you do that so everybody can see who you are. And uh, just, he's the only man walking down the aisle right now, all right? Um, and if you've got anything you'd like to give Brother Benny, just keep on walking, Brother Benny. Just keep on walking. We want everybody to see you. If you'd like to donate and help that, you can see him. And uh, last year, all right, Benny, you, you just, just remind me now. Last year, did you not tell Silver Bay we needed to have a few more workers or whatever there? And we had more people there than we'd had any previous year. Is that correct? How many people had 123 people at Silver Bay? Now, you, you can take care of your meal, but if you'd like to take care of and help with the cost, you can give that to Brother Benny. And these kids get to go out and do that every year. And we'd love to have as many as that want to go to come right there to Silver Bay. Now, if you don't like fish, I think they have something besides fish. I don't, I don't know what it would be. They got steak, chicken, dessert. And uh, we'd love to have you there. Then also, our school, in your bulletin, there's all kind of things about fundraisers. But uh, this fall, uh, we're having a fundraising event by the sophomore and junior classes, October the 6th. And that would be this Saturday, this Friday, this Friday from 3 to 7 p.m. at the pavilion behind the children's home. Um, there'll be live music and hot dogs and hamburger plates there. So if you want to be involved in that, we'd appreciate you being there. And then also, our, uh, on the back of our bulletin, just want to make this known to everybody that we've got our birthdays and anniversaries. And uh, we only have two anniversaries that, that are listed for the month of October. And if you have an anniversary in October or your birthday is not listed there, then uh, if you'll let us know, we'll, we'll include you. And uh, 
That way we'll know that your birthday is this month. We might even, somebody might send you something or, or whatever, but actually we can't do that. We have like a, the whole week there. Is that right? Oh, no, we got Monday. Let's see. Today, Christine Waters' birthday today. Joanne Goodwin tomorrow. Ruth Grant Tuesday. William King Thursday. Is that right? I got that right? That's good. So how many of y'all got the bulletin? You got that on the back? How many of y'all like to get a card for your birthday? Well, since nobody raised your hand, I hope nobody gets one on your birthday. <laughs> that way you won't have to worry about being disappointed. Amen. How many of you, when you get cards today, have you ever noticed people open cards today very carefully? They want to make certain that something's not sliding out. Have you ever noticed that? They open cards today. Now, when I was a kid, we used to open, oh, that's from Grandma, that's great. Now it's like, <laughs> I'm not... We're not necessarily promoting that, but just let somebody know happy birthday, happy. Now, we don't have the year you were born, so nobody will know how old you are, all right? How many, how many of you are stuck on 30? Would you raise your hand? Oh, yeah, yeah, stuck on 30. How many are stuck on 40? How many don't care anymore? Raise your hand. It just doesn't matter anymore, does it? You know everybody had their hand ups over 50? <laughs> doesn't matter anymore, but uh, we're not trying to discern your age we're not trying to snoop and do that we already know your age that's just there to be an encouragement to you one of my favorite things to do is be able to call somebody and tell them happy birthday because there's nothing negative to talk about it's just a, a good time happy birthday glad that glad you have a great birthday or happy anniversary been married for how many years and they tell you it's a blessing so um, fellas if you'll come we'll receive the lord's tithe and offer this morning this is missions month and uh Dr. Aiken is coming this way. I've asked him to just make mention a little bit about uh, this thing we're about to put into the plate on our commitment to missions. I hope you've prayed about it. But we do have Harry Major came through his surgery and, and, uh, as, as well as Nancy Rose and then uh, Margie uh, Rugg, Dr. Rugg's sister as well. He, she came through. We, we praise the Lord for that. But I've asked Dr. Aiken to say just a word about missions before we Yeah, Thank you, Dr. Aiken. Appreciate you being here. Somebody told me the other day I was as old as dirt. <laughs> I may not be as old as dirt, but I'm made out of dirt. <laughs> How many of you know that? <laughs> Amen. He made us from the dust to the ground. Amen. Well, it's good to be here. I was thinking as the pastor asked me just a few minutes ago uh, to say something about faith promise, a verse came to my mind, and, um, and uh, I, I want to just give you this verse. But how many of you know that um, in missions, we expect our missionaries to um, go by faith? How many of you know that? Put your hand up. You know this by faith. And uh, how many of you know that they have to go out into churches and raise their support from independent Baptist churches? How many of you know that? Okay. Uh, when I took over the mission board after Dr. Howard passed away and the pastor asked me if I would direct the mission board. We have a policy of Tabernacle Baptist Missions International that the director of the board has to raise his own support. He doesn't get a salary. He's not paid for doing that. He has to raise his support like a missionary. So that's what I'm having to do in a sense. And, uh, and every missionary under our board has to go by faith. You understand that? Everybody understand that? Okay. A faith promise missions. When we say give a faith promise offering, we're simply asking you as a member of Tabernacle Baptist Church and as a believer and as a child of God that has a heart and a desire for world evangelism, we're asking you by faith to walk by faith like you're asking the missionaries to do and to give by faith, okay? And I believe there's one verse, and this is the words of Jesus, and it expresses how we give by faith. Now, most of us, and I'm included in this because I'm human, humanly speaking, we want to make sure we've got it in the account before we spend it. Am I right about that? Now, maybe not everybody lives that way, but we do in our house. If it's not in the account, we can't spend it. And we want to be sure that we have enough coming in so that we have that that can go out. In other words, pay the bills. And uh, we, um, 
We exercise. We, we do that by faith. Uh, but we also walk by sight. Well, in missions, it's by faith. And faith promise giving is by faith. Now, the way it works is you give, and then the Lord provides. Amen. It's not the other way around. The Lord provides, and then you give. Now, you give by faith as you're asking the missionaries to go by faith. And so you pray and you ask God what he would have you to give to missions by faith, whatever it is. And uh, then you give it. And my wife and I have always given tithes and offerings to missions over the years. And we still do. I'm not pastor of Tabernacle Baptist Church any longer, but I'm a member. And so as a member, I tithe to this church. But I also give into the mission program. I'm a missionary. In essence, I'm a missionary. But I give just like uh, you do into missions every month every week actually my wife and I I write a check every week I have it right here and I'll put that in a moment and part of that check is missions and the other part is ties to Tabernacle Baptist Church do that every week and we do that by faith we don't necessarily sit down and figure it up and I let's see if I, let's see if I've got this but we just ask the Lord and he lays a figure on our heart then we uh, we write that on the card and we put it in the offering bag. I put mine in Wednesday night. And uh, you know, I was at the service and I had it. And so I just dropped it in the offering pan on Wednesday night. And I put on that card what the Lord had laid on my heart to give for missions for this coming year. So that's what we're asking you to do as well. By faith, trust in the Lord to supply the need. Why don't you just trust God and prove God? And ask God what he'd have you to do. And whatever the figure he puts on your heart and on your mind, then you give that to missions on a weekly or a monthly basis or however you uh, normally give or uh, can give in that way. And then just trust God to supply the need. You give first and then trust the Lord to provide. Now here's the verse, Luke 6, 38. What's the first word? Can you say it? Give, and it shall be given unto you. Not given unto you, and then you give. But you give, and then it will be given unto you. God will provide. And God uses you and I to provide for missions. We don't have yard sales. We don't have cakewalks. We don't have festivals to provide. We're dependent on God's people by faith obedient to God, giving what the Lord lays upon your heart. Amen. Now let me read the verse and I'm done. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Now I don't know about you, but I like those kinds of blessings. <laughs> Amen. 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 I like the running over part. Amen. Amen. Running over. Shall men give into your bosom, for with the same measure that ye meet, or with the same measure that you give, with all it shall be measured to you again. And I often say on this verse, and I preach on this verse uh, in meetings sometimes, but I often say in this verse, I'll guarantee you your shovel is not as big as God's. If you shovel it out, you'll never outgive the Lord's shovel. I promise you. You'll never outgive God. And my wife and I have proved that. Others of you that are here today, you've proved that by obedience to the Lord. And so if you have not prayed, you should pray and then obediently give what the Lord would have you to give to missions. And here at Tabernacle now, our mission giving that comes in on a weekly basis or monthly basis uh, supports our missionaries. And so the more that the Lord gives us through your faith giving, then the more missionaries we can take on and we can add to our mission giving. And that's what the Lord would have us to do is continue to reach out, continue to go forward, continue to move out and reaching the world with the gospel of Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, help us 
to faithfully pray and faithfully give and faithfully go in missions. And I pray now that you'll speak to hearts concerning this matter of giving to missions and that, Lord, they'll be obedient to you to give that which you will have laid upon their heart to give into the work of world evangelism as we endeavor to reach the world with the gospel of Christ. Now bless and sanctify this offering. I pray, Lord, uh, increase our giving and increase our blessing, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want to say, isn't it good to have Robbie's family here with us today? I feel like we ought to take a vote. Annadale's singing bass, but I almost want to just get her to stand up there and smile. That would be a pretty picture there. That would be. And uh, glad that they're here to sing today. So, Robbie, y'all sing. We'll try it again. How about that? We'll try to hit. Will there be a next time? When I need some mercy, will grace be sufficient? Oh, how will I know the next time my heart is broken? Will it be mended? Well, I have a promise that tells me it's so I just go back to the moment he saved me I just go back to every prayer he's answered for me then I don't have to worry about my next Blessing. The past is a promise. I'll have all that I need. Did he deliver Moses? Did he comfort Elijah? Was David a part? Of this promise to be, did God's son rise out of Judah? Did he walk up Golgotha? Oh, the past holds the power of this promise to me. I just go back to the moment he saved me. I just go back to every prayer he's answered for me. Then I don't have to worry about my next blessing. The past is a promise. I'll have all that I need. Brother Robbie and Miss Jan and Elena, appreciate that song. They'll sing again tonight, and you be back tonight. You can hear them sing again. Let's stand again one more time, please. Page number 60. Let's sing a couple stanzas without the music. Number 60, He 
is so precious to me. Stand, please, everyone. The Living Hymnal, page number 60. We'll sing this song without the instruments, then we'll let the choir come down in just a moment. You have the page number, page 60. Let's sing it together. So precious is Jesus, I say. together. heart's door amid sunshine and rain. How many of you are glad God didn't give up on you and just kept Amen. knocking on that door over and over again? Amen. You know, the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. And if it hadn't been for his mercy, hadn't been for his grace, wouldn't have anything to sing about. I'd like to sing that second verse. That's kind of my testimony. And I'm just glad, I'm glad that God, God, he's willing to be long-suffering with his people. And Let's sing that second verse. Hold it. Sing, sing the second, second one. Can we do it? He should have my heart so and the choir's coming down. Essence will play in the key of G there. Be fine. Whatever you want to play.
when you're shaking someone's hands, you may be seated. Sing a verse or two with me at Calvary, then the pastor will be here in just a moment. Singing together. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. No, and not it was for me. He died on Calvary. Lift it out now. Mercy there was great and grace was free. appreciate Brother Stevens. He has been such a help to me, but I know he never knows what to expect, what to do. And I get out there shaking hands with folks. So good. We have, we have about three or four families visiting here today. And listen, honestly, I'm not just saying this, but, uh, but we, we're, we are genuinely glad that you're here. And uh, I, I believe, I, I wrote a letter this morning to someone that um, had visited last week. And I think this would be the heart of our church. I believe this would be true. We believe that we have a living God, Correct. And that no matter what the need or the burden, that we have a God that's able to meet that need and to pick up that burden. And I don't think he sends, God doesn't send people here by accident. I think that God sends people here on purpose. I think people in church are on purpose. And we're glad that you're here. And though I don't have the ability to answer uh, the need, I don't have the resources to answer the need, I'm telling you this morning, I've got a God that's able to meet your need and beyond. Amen. And we are genuinely glad that you're here. This morning, I, I want you to take your Bible and go to 1 Corinthians 13. I know some had asked me about, are we going to start the book of Acts? We are. We're going to start back up, but not this morning. 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, I believe is what I want. It is. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. We have put into practice uh, this past month asking people to listen to the voice of God. And, and even this morning, Dr. Aiken got up and his encouragement to you was that we want you to listen to the voice of God and choose how you're going to give. And that would be my same, my same feeling. I've already said that. I don't want you to give a certain amount. Um, I know that card that people fill out that there's amounts on there, but there's also a blank space that you can write in whatever you'd like to write in there. And I just want people to give what God has asked them to do. That's really all I want you to do. And, you know, in saying that, in saying that, what we're saying is this. We're saying that if you're a born-again believer, that God speaks to you more than just through the Scripture. There are people that believe, and that, some good people, and I'm not trying to even correct them. I'm just preaching what I believe this morning. There are some good people, they believe that really the Holy Ghost only speaks through the Scripture. All right? I think it's more than that. And the reason I say that is in 2 Corinthians 13, the very last verse of that chapter, there's a phrase in there, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak this morning about listening or hearing the voice of God. But look, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, if you have your Bible, and you have it open, if you look there at verse number 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all, amen. Now, the first time I was introduced to that verse, I was introduced to that verse as a proof text of the Trinity, that there is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And they're all three in the passage. You have the Lord Jesus, the Son. You have the love of God, the Father. You have the communion of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit. And I never really hit, nobody really emphasized what was in the verse, especially regarding 
hearing the voice of God. If you look again, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Communion is fellowship. Communion is entering into a relationship, and the Bible speaks of the communion of the Holy Ghost, where there's a communion. We use the word communication. Communication is when two people, multiple people perhaps, they carry on a conversation. And you know, you can have a dialogue or a monologue, but when you're communicating, there is somebody receiving something and there's somebody giving something. And that's back and forth. And this is not something in the past. This is something that is present tense. The communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all, not just with the pastor. I'm glad to say this morning, I believe that God does speak through the missionary. I believe that God speaks to the missionary, to the preacher, to the pastor, through the pastor. But I do not believe by any stretch of the imagination in any form, shape, or fashion that God only speaks to men of the cloth or the clergy. I believe that God speaks to all of his children, all of them. That there is no distinction in that. That it's not that, well, God speaks to my pastor. God will speak to you if you'll give him the opportunity. And again, so when we're looking at verse 14, we're talking about communion of the Holy Ghost, an interaction between you and the Spirit of God. And uh, with that thought in mind, would you just ask God to help me to say what needs to be said this morning? Would you, Lord, we do thank you for your your presence, Lord, and your, your word. Lord, we don't want to diminish anything today. God, what we want to do today is to, to give you the liberty the platform, Lord, to to increase our trust and our faith that there is a voice from heaven that we can hear. You said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And God, what we want to do today is we want to encourage your people in that regards, not to make it difficult, not to make it something that is spiritualized, but Lord, something that is real. We believe in the communion and fellowship that we can have with you. And Lord, our lives are so enriched when we get to enjoy that. God, what a blessing it is to hear you speak to us and direct us and encourage us. And thank you, Lord, for hearing your voice in preaching and hearing your voice through radio and hearing your voice, Lord, in the small, silent times of our lives. And I pray you'd help me to help your people in that regards. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So the communion of the Holy Ghost. I would remind us all that in Genesis chapter 3, that Adam and Eve heard the voice of God walking through the garden in the cool of the day. They heard his voice. It doesn't say that they saw him, but it says that the voice of the Lord came walking through there. So God's voice in Genesis 3, interaction with people that were innocent, no, no sin, God is speaking to them. And I appreciate the Bible that God has given us. I appreciate all 1,189 chapters, all 66 books. I appreciate God giving us something for instruction, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. I appreciate all those things. But there is no doubt in my mind that God can speak more than outside of what he's written in this Bible. I'd say that for a number of reasons. If you would, turn to Psalm 19, first of all. Would you turn there just a moment? Today's going to be more of a topical message So we're going to look at some verses in the Bible. Look at Psalm 19. God's voice is heard in a number of ways, and it's heard also in creation, okay? You can hear God's voice in creation. That's what the Bible says. It says it here in Psalm 19, but it also says that in Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, the Bible's speaking about the invisible things, that God can be seen His voice can be heard by the things that are visible, the things that are created. I'll read that to you while you're turning. Uh, Psalm 19, companion passage, Romans chapter 1. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. They can be seen, they can be known, they can be understood. Psalm 19, the Bible says it this way. Verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. All right, so if you're listening this morning, the Bible is is declaring that the heavens declare the glory of God, and that the firmament, you look up there at those stars, they're showing you his handiwork. All right, verse 2, day unto day uttereth speech. So every day, 
And night unto night showeth knowledge. Every day, every night, 24 hours a day, that voice is going out. Verse 3, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. So it doesn't matter if I'm born in Brazil and speak Portuguese or if I'm born in Japan and speak Japanese or if I'm born in China and speak Mandarin or if I'm born in India and speak Hindi. It really doesn't matter the language that I speak. The Bible says that there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Creation speaks on a constant basis and it crosses every language barrier, every cultural barrier, and it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that there is a real God in heaven. Now, look, look what the Bible says in verse 4. Their line is gone out throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. So God, God through creation is saying, listen, I am alive. I created you. There is, there is someone that has more power than you. There is someone that sustains you, and that is me. His creation says that on a regular basis. And I'd like to say this morning, it frustrates me to no end sometimes to hear uh, environmentalists talk about the effect that I have on global warming, okay? It is ridiculous to me to think that by burning fuel in my car, from South Carolina to Alabama that somehow I increased the size of the hole in the ozone layer and that I'm going to cause the destruction of the planet because I burned in my backyard, I grilled hot dogs and hamburgers. Come on, are you, are you, are you saying that I'm so large? Am I so big that I have that much power to take and shake the foundation of the earth by a barbecue grill and a car made in Japan? The globe is warmed every single day, 15 to 25 degrees, and it happens when that sun rises in the east and sets in the west, and it doesn't have anything to do with mankind. It has to do with a God who set the sun in space by just speaking it into existence. That sun says that there is a God, there is a designer, there is a creator. We go through the seasons. Spring, summer, winter, and fall. We look at the beauty of the foliage. We look at the rivers. And listen, stand back in amazement and watch the Niagara River. That, that, that huge, that huge fall there at Niagara. If the earth were millions of years old, Niagara would be somewhere way back up into the northeast parts of Canada because it wears away a little every year. You, you say, how did it get here? I'll tell you how it got here. There's a God in heaven that created all things that are. Amen. And whether it's the stars and their magnificence or whether it's the beauty around us, there is a voice every day in every language saying, I made you, I'm alive, there's someone that designed you, I'm a creator, I created you. And whether men accept that or reject that, it makes no difference. That voice still goes out every day in every language because God, God speaks to people without the scripture, amen, without the scripture. He does that. I don't know if you've ever been to Yellowstone. I think every American ought to go to Yellowstone. Yellowstone is such a marvel of creation. And then you get to see all those animals he created. We got to see two eagles when we were out in Yellowstone this past summer. Two eagles. Wow. And then we saw moose. And we saw a baby moose with that moose. Well, we were so excited. Then we saw, it was amazing, amazing all that we saw. We saw elk, we saw buffalo, we saw antelope. We saw just a number of creatures. In fact, we saw so many animals. I didn't see wolves, but my son, he said that, uh, listen, there's just no way. If we saw a bear, if we saw a bear, it'd just make everything perfect. But we're not going to see a bear. And you know, on the way home, the last day out of Yellowstone, I mean, the road's filled with people. We pull over and saw a grizzly bear and her cub 150 yards from us. Sitting back there, and look, everybody's got out their cameras. And I'm talking about folks pulling in. This lady pulled in beside us, parked that thing sideways. She pulled out a camera lens. I mean, it, it had to be at least a couple of feet long. Pulled out a tripod. She sets that thing up, and she's taking pictures. And all these people are doing the same thing. I was in Virginia Beach not long ago. 
preaching in a meeting there, and I told the uh, brother there, I'd like to go see the sunrise. And so we went out there for the sunrise, and we get out there, and it was an overcast day. But the sun, when it came up, it just reflected off those clouds, this unbelievably colorful pink and orange and red hues. And I'm standing on the beach, six in the morning, and all down to my right and all down to my left, everybody has their iPhone out and their iPad out. And they have their camp again, huge cameras, and they're all taking pictures, and they're saying, wow, what beauty, what incredible beauty. And when I see that, I'm telling you, there's a God in heaven that says, evolution doesn't have the ability to make that. I made that in one moment of time. Has to be a designer to have that kind of beauty, that complexity. He says that without ever speaking anything from the Scripture. Then go to Romans chapter 2, if you would. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, God also speaks in another way. God speaks through men's conscience. Men's conscience. Romans chapter 2. Without ever hearing the Bible, without ever reading the Scripture, God speaks to men through their conscience. Romans chapter 2. The Bible says in verse number 12, For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. That means they never had the word of God. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. That's the people that have heard, rejected. Verse 13, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, in other words, they didn't have a copy, they didn't have the word of God, all throughout the Old Testament, so many of those nations had no written word of God, they would have had to go to the Jews to get it. The Bible says that when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. God speaks to men through their conscience. He put the law inside of them. They never read the law. These Gentiles, he said, that don't have the law, that inside them they have a conscience. And it is amazing. Whatever society you go into, if someone takes someone else's wife, that's not approved of. It's looked down upon. If you steal something, there are cultures that they have found that they are so stringent. When someone stole something, they would cut off their hand if they did that. All right? And when you and I, before you were ever saved, before you were ever saved, whether the Holy Ghost spoke to you or whether it was God speaking to you through your conscience, by the power of the Holy Ghost inside, something would stand up inside and say, I shouldn't be saying words like that. I shouldn't be looking at something like that. I shouldn't be involved in something like this. And you got to feeling dirty and you got to feeling guilty. And you felt bad about it. I mean, listen, I, I, I'm telling you, it, it is true. People that have never been born again, never sat inside of a church, can feel guilty about doing something against someone else that God has written down in the law. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And they feel bad because it's a work of God. God is speaking to them through their conscience and saying, listen, you're guilty. You're guilty. And I'd like to say this morning, if you're here and you're listening and you're a guest, we are so glad you're here. But if you're saved, you still experience that on a regular basis. You experience feeling guilty. You experience feeling, man, I feel dirty. I shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't have looked at that. Shouldn't have said that. And that's a natural response. And I can tell you the way to get rid of that, the way to get rid of that is not to try to do a whole lot more good than you do bad. The way to get rid of that is to tell God, God, I agree with you, I'm guilty, and I'm going to accept the payment that your son made for my sins on the cross of Calvary. Amen. Jesus Christ died 2,000 years ago on a cross. He didn't die to make mankind better. He died to take away the sin of the world. Amen. And I'd like to say this morning, are you listening? Are you listening? <laughs> to be guilty of your sin is natural. To have a conscience that's free of that guilt is supernatural. There are things that you could never go back and undo. You can't go back and undo them. If someone goes out and gets an abortion, they can't go out and undo that. If you get drunk and you run somebody over with a car and you take their life, you cannot undo that. You can't undo it. But you know what you can do? 
You can go to a God in heaven who let his son hang on a cross and die for your sins. You can go and ask him for forgiveness. And you know what he'll do? He'll wash away your sin through his blood. Amen. And when he washes away, this, washes away that sin, there's a blessing that comes along with that. It's called freedom from that guilt. And look, I, I, every now and then the devil, he'll jump back up on my shoulder and he'll tell me, you're so guilty, remember what you used to do? But on the other side, the Holy Ghost reminds me, yeah, and Jesus paid for all that. Your account is free and clear. You're all right now, son. Amen. God can do that. God can do that. And not in a confessional sense that you go and you confess to the preacher or the priest. Not at all. You confess your sin to God and you just accept his payment. That payment was made for you and I in full. And I'm telling you, anybody that's ever come to him, he in no wise cast them out. They left with a good conscience. Amen. God can do that. God can do that. And he speaks to people, whether they've ever had a Bible, ever had a track, that conscience says something's wrong. Evolution hates the idea of good and evil. And here's why. How can good and evil just be a chemical response? How can you break down good and evil into just a chemical process? And that's what evolution likes to do. Everything is just a chemical process. It's a response to stimulus. No, not at all. There is good and evil in this world. And you know what? God's one that decided what was good and what was evil. Amen. Amen. And so he speaks to people to that end. I think that's why in America we don't want the Ten Commandments on the wall of the school. We don't want people feeling guilty. Well, if they don't feel guilty, then they'll never be saved. But if you ever feel guilty, you can get saved. And then after you get saved, you'll feel a whole lot better. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so God is speaking through conscience. He's speaking through creation. But he also speaks through his Holy Ghost. Look at John chapter 16. John 16. John chapter 16, and this is just trying to help us get to the place that we can understand, how do I hear the voice of God? I've had my children ask me that question. How do you hear God's voice, Dad? Okay, you're going to pray about what you're going to write down on that card. How do you hear his voice? How do you hear God's voice in making a decision on whether or not to step away from Alabama and go to Greenville and be a pastor? How do you, how do you hear that? How do you hear that? We could give our experience, but I think the scripture is the best. John 16, verse 13. I know our church believes this, but the Bible is very clear. Howbeit he, when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. Aren't you glad you've got a God that can guide you into all truth? All truth. In other words, the Holy Spirit can guide you, but you have to let him do that. You have to give him that opportunity. Go to Acts 16. I'll show that to you. Look, Acts 16. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts 16. Well, I don't hear too many pages turning. That makes me nervous. One day somebody's going to invent an app for all those new Bibles on the iPad with the pages flipping there. Acts 16. Paul, a man of God. Paul. He wants to serve the Lord. He wants to do what's right. He's already been out and hazarded his life on the mission field. And now he's come to another point and he's trying to figure out what direction to take. Verse number 6, chapter 16. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. So the Holy Ghost told the Apostle Paul, you may not preach the gospel in Asia. Now he did later. But he's telling him not right now. He's directing his step. The Holy Ghost forbade him. Look at verse 7. After they were come to Mycenae, they essayed to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. You see that in your Bible? The Spirit of God is telling Paul, no, I don't want you to go into Bithynia. And he's already told him, no, I'm not going to allow you to go into Asia. The Holy Ghost is speaking to Paul. Now, you're not going to find anywhere in the Scripture that that was written down. There's no Old Testament Scripture that that was written out in. And so Paul is trying to hear the voice of God. Look at it again, chapter 20. Look at chapter 20. Again, I'm just saying, does God speak? I believe God speaks through the Holy Ghost to his people. Chapter 20. Look at Acts chapter 20. Actually, turn to 21. Acts 21 and verse number 4. 
And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul, through the Spirit, that he should not go to Jerusalem. So they're speaking to Paul through the Spirit. Verse 11, same chapter. And when he was come to us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost. You see that? Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So here the Holy Ghost is speaking. He speaks through a person, but he's also speaking through Agabus. And he's saying, listen, this man, whoever's girdle this is, I'm giving you a message from the Holy Ghost. He's speaking to him. He's not giving him something in the scripture. He's not telling him something that you can find in the Bible. But the Holy Ghost is still speaking to Paul. He's doing it through another individual. I believe that happens today. I believe God can speak through another individual. It could be a preacher during a service. It could be somebody at a table. It could be on a radio, but God can speak through people. His Spirit speaks through us. I believe that we are the hands of the Holy Spirit and the mouth of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost lives inside of us. I'm His temple, so He can speak through me. That doesn't mean everything that I say is from God. I believe this. Are you listening? Are you listening? I I believe this all my heart. It is not my responsibility to tell you the decisions you should make in your life. I can let you know what I think and give you choices, but ultimately, you know what I think you ought to do? I think you ought to listen to God and decide what you ought to do with your life. Because I don't need to give an account of what you do. I can't do that. I need to direct you as much as I can with the Bible, but you need to be able to hear God's voice. And here's what does not happen. You don't see a light when you hear God's voice. It's not there's some illumination that comes in the room or the hair on the back of your neck stands up. The hair on the back of my neck stands up when I walk inside a fence that says, beware of dog, and it comes around the corner. (laughs) Yesterday while visiting, I got out of the car, and I thought, I'm going to go up here. I'd made an appointment with the family, and I thought, okay, I'm going to go see them. And a couple of dogs come running up, and they're little dogs, and they're barking and all that kind of good stuff, and nobody comes out of the house. I say, well, it must be fine, and I get out, and these little dogs, they may not have had big teeth, but they were intent on putting them into my feet somewhere. I got a feeling. And I felt better when the gentleman came out and said, oh, we got all kind of killer dogs around here. But I noticed he kept looking at the dogs. He never took the fear away from me. I I need to just get inside the house is what I need to do. It's not about something you feel on the back of your neck. It's not about hearing some audible voice. If you hear an audible voice, more than likely you're in heaven. God speaks through his word, but he does speak through the spirit. And I'm going to show you that, and I'm going to be finished. 1 Kings 19, because some of y'all are looking at me real funny right now. 1 Kings 19. My purpose in preaching this is to try to say, you can hear the voice of God. Well, what does it sound like? I'm going to show you. God does speak through creation. God does speak through your conscience. But God also speaks through his Holy Spirit. And here... In 1 Kings chapter 19, Elisha, rather Elijah, is going. He's running. God's told him where to go, and he goes to Horeb, the Bible says. And in verse number 9, the Bible says, And he came thither into a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Ask him a question. He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they that seek my life, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. So God tells him first, he asks him a question in verse 9, and then at the end of verse 10, or rather in verse 11, he tells him to go forth and stand on a mount. Or again, no scripture for that anywhere. It's just God speaking to his man. The Bible says, And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. So we have this strong wind. Think Hurricane Irma. We have an earthquake. Think Mexico City. We have a fire. Think Yellowstone. All these things are going on. All these noises, all this, 
all this visual picturing. End of verse number 12. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? That still, small voice. Now, I believe you can hear the voice of God through creation and through your conscience, and I believe the Holy Ghost does speak, that still, small voice says two things to me, and I'm finished this morning. Listen, two things. Number one, still. Isn't it hard to get still? Today, we're a busy people. In fact, let's just be still for just a minute. How about that, all right? Just want you to be still. Don't move, don't do anything. We haven't made it 30 seconds and some of you are about to stand up and scream right now, aren't you? I mean, you, you feel like you... <laughs> if you want to hear the Spirit of God speak, a still, small voice. You know what that still means? Still. You're going to have to take some time just to listen. To sit and listen. For me... I drive down the road, my radio's on, my phone come, turns on, I've got it over the speaker, I'm talking on it, I come to the church, there's always constant noise. Everywhere I am, everywhere I go, there's always noise. If there's not noise, many times we turn something on. I've had people tell me that. I leave the TV in the background just so I can hear the noise. There's always noise. But if you really want to communicate with God, you got to get still. you got to get still. The best communication always comes when there's two people looking at each other and they're still. Texting is not the best way to communicate. Would anybody say amen to that besides me? You have to explain how, how redundant and ridiculous that I have to explain everything that I text. So I put smiley faces on mine. If you've gotten text from me, I put a smiley face at the end so you don't have to call me up and say, how come you said that ugly thing to me? I do. If I put a frowny face then you know it's a frowny face. Can't see you. All I can do is just see the words. You got to get still. And today, we multi, we talked to 12 people at one time. We got somebody we're texting. We got somebody we're talking to here. We got somebody standing in front of us talking. I told you, when I go to, when I, I need to quit or I'm gonna run, I'll run all day. I go to, when I go to a grocery store, I get off my phone in the line. I put it, I say, excuse me just a minute. I set it down. And I talk to the lady behind the checkout or the man. I say, Hi, how's your day today? It's good, good, good. And they say, it'd be $30, $30 or whatever, $12, 15 cents. Okay, put that in there. And then I say, okay, it's not, okay, you need to go ahead. You go to the sign right there. Okay, that's great. I sign right there. I said, yeah, we might talk a little bit, carry on conversation. And, and I've asked him before, I said, how many people just talk to, on the phone as they're going through the line? Everybody. I said, do you have to tell people more than one time how much the price is? Yes. Is that frustrating to you? And now they're looking around. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we want God to talk to us, but we've got conversations going on in a, a thousand other ways instead of just getting still. And then look, the other thing he says about it, that voice was this, verse number 12. It was small. It was a small voice. Oh. As I get older, I, I, don't, I don't hear like I used to hear. And uh, my grandfather, <laughs> my grandfather, when you talk to him, he always said the same thing. Hey, granddaddy. First thing out of his mouth, he'd say, huh? Huh? Hey, granddaddy, what time are we leaving to go fishing? Huh? And you know, if you didn't respond, he'd say, about 9 o'clock. But he said it so often, so many times. Huh? 
And the older I get, it's hard to hear what people say sometimes. I, I, you know, I've, I've been accused of being hard of hearing for much of my life. All right, but I'm genuinely, it's hard. And when somebody talks quietly, and there are some people in this world, they, they do not have a very robust voice. <laughs> you say something to them, and they say something back, and listen, I have done this, and it's terrible to do it, but I have asked, I'm sorry, and then I've said, could you repeat that? And then after doing that about twice, then I just start doing this. <laughs> and hope I get it. Because I can't get it. We, at the Pickens County camp meeting Friday night, and I, I, I felt embarrassed. But I put my hand to my ear. I felt like the guy that had the megaphone stuck at the side of his ear. Because this lady is testifying, and I wanted to hear what she's saying, but I couldn't. You can't rejoice. Look, I guess you could rejoice. Everybody else is shouting, okay, whoo, glory. Hey, man, I'm in there. But I wanted to hear what she was saying, so I'm trying to listen. I'm trying to do it discreetly so nobody notices that I'm doing that. Because I wanted to hear. When somebody speaks in a small voice, you gotta, or you got to get down on their level. Little child's talking, to, especially little girls. Little girls start talking to you, you got to get down there. Now, what did you say? I said that I'm so glad to be here today. Could you say that again? You get closer, they get quieter. I'm so glad to be here today. <laughs> and you know what I'm trying to tell you right now? It's not going to be some big booming voice. It's not going to be like Constantine seeing this thing in the sky conquering this sign. It doesn't work that way. It's a still, small voice. You've got to take the time and the effort to hear what he's saying. Creation, conscience, the Holy Ghost, amen. And he would never speak contrary to the Bible. I believe that. So anybody ever tells you otherwise, the Holy Ghost would never speak contrary to the Bible. But if you want to hear what he's got to say, you got to take the time and you got to make the effort to listen. And if you'll do that, I believe he'll speak to you. Now, I know most of us already put that faith promise card in. Some haven't. Perhaps you're still wrestling with that. Matters not. What I'm trying to preach this morning is how you can follow the direction of the Holy Ghost. I believe you can. I believe you can. And I believe we ought to. And if we really want to be the kind of Christian we should be, we ought to listen more to him than we do to Rush Limbaugh. We ought to listen more to him than we listen to the majority's voice. We ought to listen to him. Sometimes God will ask you to do something that really is just not comfortable. But he knows best. Amen. Amen. Stand to your feet, please, if you would. Thank you for your attention this morning. <clears throat> All right. Trying not to make something mystical, something spiritualized or saying, well, I've just never heard God's voice. Well, take some time, put forth the effort, and just say, God, would you speak to me? You can do that about a number of things in your life. I found that if you'll obey him, he'll speak to you more often. The less you obey, the less he speaks. But the more you obey, the more he speaks to you. That's just the way God works. Lord, we do thank you for the opportunity we've had today to look in your Bible. And I know we've been talking to people about seeking your will on what to give by faith promise. But it, it's not just in that area of our life that we need your will and your voice. Thank you for giving us a perfect Bible. Thank you for giving us a guide for our life. Thank you for giving us something that would direct our steps, Lord. And then thank you, for Lord, for being big enough to be able to speak to us if we could just get still and put forth the effort to hear what you have to say not just run off in a flash. And I pray you'd continue speaking. God, you've done that here so many years. I know our people believe all that's been preached this morning. But there may be somebody here today, Lord, that doesn't know you as Savior. There may be somebody here that they do feel guilty. There's a, there's a gnawing in their soul. God, I pray you'd help them to see that that's just you trying to let them know, hey, there's a heaven to gain. All they have to do is step out by faith. I pray you'd let them see that. 
We thank you for all you've done today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 God. Well, we got people praying. I think we're not going to say, God bless you, dismiss. The altar's open. If you need to get on the altar, I'm going to leave that open for you. Anybody need to get there? Amen, son. How about you? Anybody? You need God's direction on something? Might be good to get on an altar for a little while. Amen, son. Amen, brother. Anybody else? Got decisions to make. Got things I'm looking, trying to hear God's voice. Anybody else like that? Anybody else? Didn't intend to give an invitation, but I'm not going to stop God from giving one. All I got to do is just listen. He wants to speak to us. He delights in it just like a father or a child. He doesn't play games. He's not trying to make it some difficult thing for you to figure out so he can say, wow, I really made that complex and hard for them to understand. That's not the way God works. He's a good father. Got another couple come to the altar. I can't close it with that going on. Anybody else? Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? God can speak to us. Boy, and for all these guests today, how many are glad that we had guests today? If you got one close to you, make sure you tell them before they get out now. Hey, glad you came to Tabernacle Baptist Church. Glad you're here. Come back again. And uh, you're dismissed see tonight. Did you say choir practice tonight at 5 o'clock? No choir practice tonight at 5 o'clock. You get to sleep an extra hour. God bless you. Amen.